Finding Our Voice, the Dallas gay and lesbian community is made possible in part by Uptown Realtors, with 80 associates and staff that serve and reflect the diversity of Dallas. By Crest Auto Group, supporting black tie in the community for 13 years. Crest's family of fine cars, Infinity, Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Isuzu. By Via Star Services Corporation, which salutes the heroes of the Dallas gay and lesbian community by members like you, with additional financial support provided by the following individuals and foundations. I really did not have any idea when I came out what all of the consequences would be of that one act. How can we have a future if we don't have a past? The message is that it's okay to be violent against gay men and lesbians, and that's not true. I don't know that a lot of the younger folks know how hard we fought. A chant that I remember from, from the March on Washington, it was, we're here, we're queer, you better get used to us. Well, it seems like in Dallas, it's almost like we're here, we're queer, we work, we pay our taxes, we keep our yards up. But until we tell the truth about who we are and decide what we want and go after it, we're just stuck and then someone else is making the rules and someone else is defining our lives. If the world doesn't understand me, then I've got to change the world. Visibility and voice and people knowing who we are is what changes societies. By the 1940s, Dallas already had a growing gay culture. The grapevine was working overtime. Word had it, there was a special boarding house in Oak Cliff called the Lavender Shingle. And how did they advertise? Word of mouth, you know. They never had a vacancy. Philip Johnson is the unofficial historian of the Dallas gay community and its culture. Twenty-six floors up, topping off the Magnolia Petroleum Building, a flying red horse watched over the hustle and bustle of a boomtown. Pegasus was the beacon used by gay soldiers to find one another at Maggie's Corner. World War II would change everything. Johnson enlisted, reporting to duty at Fort Ord, where he would meet Mother Stella, his master sergeant. And he reached out with a great big old fat arm, grabbed me around my waist, and pulled me up against his cheek, and looked up at me and said, Mercy, where have you been all my life? I stood there, embarrassed, turned red, I'm sure, and he, with surprising agility, rose from the chair and said, Come, let me introduce you to the rest of the girls. Girls, I want you to meet I'm going to call him Phyllis. No, I'm going to call him Sweet Phyllis. Well into the 60s, gay culture continued to percolate around the country. In Dallas, it was barely below the surface and primarily in bars. There were no churches, no organizations, uh, absolutely nothing. Lori Masters migrated to Dallas from Fort Worth in 1960. She was 17 and pregnant. I was only married to my husband about seven months. My husband and I were already separated when my daughter was born. And I was living with a woman when my daughter was born. <laughs> well, I tried it and I didn't like it. But she did find enjoyment and cultural enrichment at the Villa Fontana, the first gay bar she ever set foot in. 
It was a wonderful place to just go and have a drink and feel like you could be yourself. Sit and visit and feel like we were normal people. Papa Joe Morin owned a bar called Elvira's. Elvira's had a, it was either a red or a blue light over the door so that if somebody came in that no one knew or that was suspicious or could be the police or the vice squad, then that light was slipped on behind the bar. That meant there's somebody here. And there was also a rule that if you were on the dance floor at that time and you were dancing with a woman, a woman dancing with a woman, that we would separate and, and you know, sit down or start dancing with a man. It was real cloak and dagger. Police routinely raided gay bars during the 60s, hauling some of the deviant clientele off to jail. When I formed the Circle of Friends, the first gay organization in Texas, in this room, on this sofa, curtains were drawn, and people were told not to park up and down in front of my house, spread out a bit. You know, we were afraid the police would come and knock on the door. June 1969, New York City. Police provoke street riots with drag queens in front of the Stonewall Bar. Tagged as the beginning of the gay civil rights movement in America, the event did not immediately resonate with gay culture in Dallas. And it did not stop vice cops from raiding gay bars. A reporter from the Herald came to visit me and said, uh, how do you respond to what the uh, Dallas police chief has said? And I said, the man's so full of hot air, it's ridiculous. I said, we have no secrets, but uh, if he wants a battle like Stonewall, I guarantee him we could give it to him. And so began the Dallas Gay Political Caucus, with Chance West as the organization's first president. It was 1976. When I was in junior high, I even ventured to secretly and very carefully look up the word homosexual in the dictionary. Richard Vincent was the first to take up a pulpit in Dallas on behalf of the Metropolitan Community Church. Primary goals was to uh, provide a place that people could feel free to worship God without fear or discrimination. Vincent also helped organize the city's first gay pride parade in 1972. Participants marched through the heart of downtown. And as always, it was the drag queens who were pushing the envelope. There was great apprehension. People were predicting that somebody was going to get killed, it was going to be a carnage, uh, that, that they shouldn't be doing this, uh, all sorts of things. The 70s blossomed with gaiety. The momentum coming from political organization and organized religion, drag queens who took to the streets, and dykes on bikes. I did have a Harley, yes, I had a Harley chopper. I was a little bit of a exhibitionist back then. Uh, I, um, that's a nice word for it. And we all rode, and we rode. It was um, absolutely fabulous to see 40, 50 women pulling up in the parking lot of a bar on motorcycles. They called themselves the Flying W Motorcycle Club. W for women. Would you point or say anything rude to 40 or 50 dykes on motorcycles? No. <laughs> we never had any problems. Never. While some members of the Flying W's were living their own version of what it meant to be a feminist in those early years of the movement, Charlotte Taft arrived in Dallas. It was 1974. I had a master's degree in feminist studies and a bachelor's degree in feminist studies of all odd things. She also became the director of one of Dallas's first and eventually most high-profile abortion clinics. In the historical legal sense, all of the legal cases that were filed about gay rights were, were almost all founded on Roe versus Wade, on the concept of the right to privacy, which was a 1973 Supreme Court decision. While she was completely outspoken and committed as an abortion rights activist, Charlotte Taft was not publicly identified as a lesbian. Eventually, she would be outed on television. I realized that coming out, even though I was actually announced on a television show that was widely seen over Texas, still coming out is an experience that you get to do over and over and over. And the piece that I was interested in was not in any way holding myself hostage by my fear, 
my fear of what someone else would think or what someone else would do, that was really, really important to me claiming my integrity. Coming out is one of those strange terms that means something different to everyone. I never felt a need to have a press conference or issue a written statement. I just started dating men and just went on with my life. I was coming from a life as a married heterosexual father of two Baptist minister of music. And I came to Dallas as a single gay man leaving children and ex-wife behind and certainly leaving the Baptist church behind. And talk about a paradigm shift. All of my values, everything that I had felt in my heart to be the truth, no longer was my truth. A select group of gays and lesbians who had come of age during the 60s brought their revolutionary ideas to Dallas during the 70s. We were all very committed. We all had kind of, you know, been forged by the, again, the uh, civil rights movement. My partner and I met there in 1971 when we were both members of the Gay Liberation Front at the University of Colorado. When Louise Young and her partner Vivian Armstrong came to Dallas, Young was a PhD without a job. She had just been fired from a university teaching job in Oklahoma because she was a lesbian. I think that made quite an impression on me that I had to continue my activism. I, I felt like, well, if the world doesn't understand me, then I've got to change the world. When I came back to Dallas in 1976, there were a few bars, uh, there was the MCC, but there was no formal structure or really a thing that we know today, as we know today, as a gay community. The grandson of a Dallas preacher, Don Baker enlisted in the Navy and there began to question whether he was a homosexual. My understanding of homosexual people was just the mental image I had that I got from um, what, I what I heard from the pulpit in church about how bad they were. I had had this awakening or this uh, uh, almost like a born-again experience and I was really looking for a place to live out that kind of, of new commitment. And By the time Baker hooked up with Louise Young and Vivian Armstrong, they were primed to advance gay rights. We arrived in Dallas in the fall of 76 and still wanted to be activists and we're just kind of looking for a home as, as the the song goes, and happened one night in a women's bar to see a poster, a very nice poster, that announced a meeting of the Dallas Gay Political Caucus. The first item of business for Baker and Young and Steve Wilkins was to introduce the gay community to a straight-laced Dallas. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Their efforts gained momentum from an unexpected source and Anita Bryant kind of catapult us into this um, sense of mission. The singer had successfully spearheaded a campaign in Miami to overturn a gay rights ordinance. Because I have a peace and a joy in my heart knowing that I did what was right. And, uh, and, and I believe that the, the great majority of people across America are in agreement, that they've had enough, that, that, that we do not want to take away human rights, but that, but that we do not believe uh, uh, in special privileges uh, to take away the constitutional rights of the normal majority. I was content to just be playing around and had no focus on the political community or sense of gay community at all until Anita Bryant. And we're met with protest and uh, um, all kinds of problems. And uh, uh, every... Oh, oh, oh. Security agent, security agent. No, no, let, let him stay. No. Let him stay. Well, at least it's a fruit pie. Huh. Let's, pray. Let's pray for him right now. Anita, right now. let's pray. Anita, why don't you pray? It's all right. Father, we want to thank you. This is getting to be a problem for Anita Bryant. Since her campaign for the repeal of a homosexual rights ordinance in Miami, there are gay power demonstrations everywhere she goes. In June of 77, uh, gays and lesbians from all over Texas uh, converged on Houston where she was singing at American Bar Association uh, convention. And so we marched through the streets of downtown Houston. It was just an incredible, uh, incredible event. It was electricity. 
we believe in conversation rather than confrontation. This is the Dallas approach. You know, well, to me, if you go to the mayor's office, you, you go doing business, you go in a suit. One of the major milestones yes. was when Steve Wilkins took the leadership, yes. and he could articulate uh, our issues very clearly, and he kind of uh, very professionally and very systematically was able to present our cause to the community as a whole. I don't know that he realized the enormity of, of, of his contribution. We got much further in the mayor's office dressed in suits because we were there to do business. In 1977, a court ruling in Washington state prompted then Dallas school superintendent, Dr. Nolan Estes, to declare that any teacher identified as homosexual would be fired. Nolan Estes said there were no gay school teachers. Oh, yeah, he so certainly that's how he did. Started off. Then he made the comment about if there were, they would be fired. But right. it's his understanding there weren't any, of course, obviously. Amazing, huh? Nolan, when asked how would he do it, he said, oh, I'll just let the, the, the students and the parents will know if someone is gay and they'll tell me, which was pretty terrifying to, to many of us because it would have been like an inquisition like Dallas has never seen. It was crazy. Myself, I was a school teacher and I took it personally. His name is Mark, and because of a secret he keeps from the elementary school children he teaches, he asked that his identity be withheld. The secret he keeps from his students and colleagues alike is a sensitive one. He is a homosexual. Can you give me a conservative estimate of how many gays are on faculties at area schools? There are perhaps around 500 teachers in the Dallas Independent School District whose sexual orientation is homosexual. Don Baker's public declaration as a homosexual teacher raised the ante. The tension grew. Steve Wilkins arranged a meeting with two friendly school board members. Afraid that he might lose his job, Baker hid inside a closet. And we talked for five or ten minutes with his talking through the door, and finally he said, I'm not doing this anymore. And I came barging through and I said, Herod Earhart, I'm a homosexual school teacher. <laughs> he said, I'm not hiding behind this door any longer. <laughs> it was, um, it was a dramatic scene. Closet doors all over Dallas were beginning to crack open for all sorts of reasons. There was a lot of unrest in, in the, the gay bars. People were being hauled in uh, to, to police headquarters uh, out of the gay bars, so there was a lot of emotion. The gay community was already organizing and was already teaching gays and lesbians in Dallas how to become involved in electoral politics, which I, I knew nothing about at all. I met Louise Young around that same time because she was very involved in democratic politics. Louise Young served as the third president of the Gay Political Caucus. By 1980, Don Baker was president and had filed a lawsuit in federal court challenging the state's anti-sodomy law, known as 2106. This law is an indictment against the integrity and dignity of all homosexuals in the state. Efforts to purge the nemesis also resonated through state Democratic Party politics. Hundreds and hundreds of people came for the sole purpose of learning how to go to their precinct convention and being <laughs> elected delegates. So, and they went by the hundreds. And they went by the hundreds. <laughs> and they took their little resolutions and said that they wanted to have 2106 of the Texas State Penal Code repealed. Right. And, you know, that they were looking, you know, for, you know, additional, you know, equality. It was just wonderful. Oh, it was, it was incredible. These were heady, exhilarating times, further fueled by a national march on Washington in 1979. We had a whole bus. <laughs> busloads of gay Texans um, who went to Washington for the march. It was just really one of the most remarkable moments of my life to see that much energy directed towards something for good. And we were scared. We were very scared that something could happen because here we were, we were targets and we were out in the open. Um, so it took great courage to do it. Dallas gays were high energy and felt it was high time to party and to revive Pegasus as a beacon for gay life. I can remember emblems of, of Pegasus, you know, just they wanted this whole image, you know, the Dallas image, fun, glitz, sparkle, all of this, it was all there. It was called Razzle Dazzle Dallas, 
the first party of its kind in the city's history, the event attracted thousands of gays to the Hall of State at Fair Park. And I couldn't help but remember looking around and seeing uh, these great Texas fathers like Davy Crockett and William Travis, you know, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I bet they're just turning over in their grave right now. The idea for Razzle Dazzle Dallas belonged in large part to Bill Nelson, a man whose style clashed with that of Don Baker. And we are going to the Texas legislature, we are going to the Dallas City Council, we are going to the state courts, and we are going to the general public. The two men also had much in common. Like Don Baker, Nelson was a teacher and the grandson of a minister. So this was a new infusion of, of uh, new ideas and new blood and, and, and kind of started us down a, a, a new path in, new in, 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 in activism. The champagne flowed tonight at a bar on Cedar Springs, a celebration of the second step in a victory 37-year-old Don Baker has won for all gay men and women in Texas. A federal judge would usher in a gust of fresh air, outlawing the law that made outlaws of gay Texans. As history would have it, the euphoria was short-lived. The federal judge's ruling was overturned by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Mr. Nelson, uh, as president of the Dallas Gay Alliance, that puts a, a rather special uh, emphasis on your candidacy as a possible... Nelson decided to run for Dallas City Council in 1985 as the city's first open gay candidate. Should Dallas have gay police officers? Dallas should have the most qualified people on the police department that it can find. Their sexual orientation has absolutely nothing to do with their ability to do the job well or to do it poorly. Anticipating that 2106 would remain on the books, Nelson put himself in the public spotlight, initiating a shift from the polite Dallas way to a more in-your-face approach. Bill is the one who really blew the closet door off his hinges. William Wayborn, Bill Nelson, and John Thomas had assumed control of the alliance and appeared invincible. I think a lot of it has to do with William Wayburn's savviness at marketing, PR, and working with the media or media manipulation, depending on your point of view. John was the Trojan horse. Bill was the visionary. Wayborn and Nelson opened an antique store called Crossroads Market at the corner of Cedar Springs and Throckmorton. It became the anchor for a strip of shopping and partying that offered a totally gay environment but not everyone felt welcome at the party. Women were not allowed in the popular gay dance bars if they were wearing sandals or open-toed shoes. They just turned you away at the door, but it was just BS. It was just a rule to keep us out of bars. I had the slam for being a, a woman trying to get into a bar where I couldn't have open-toed shoes. I had to have three picture IDs, and then being a minority because a lot of the, the gay males African-American and Hispanic men were having to produce triple ID. So it was, it was double whammy of being in two groups that were being discriminated against. And when the board of the Dallas Gay Political Caucus voted in the early 80s to change its name, the word lesbian was left out. I mean, it's still the source of a lot of pain, even though you've kind of put it behind you. You still think, Wow, you know, when push came to shove and a vote came down, we lost the vote because we were in the minority. And I mean, that's, that's in a microcosm how gays and lesbians are in America today. It wasn't long before John Thomas, William Wayborn, Bill Nelson, and other white gay men found out what it was like to be marginalized. One evening, we were a bunch of the guys from the board of directors. I say guys because at that time I was the only female on the board of directors of the Dallas Gay Alliance. And so we were having a social activity, di a dinner or something, and we were sitting around talking and someone said, oh, have you heard about this thing? There's some gay men that are sick in San Francisco and some in New York, and there's even one case in Houston. And what someone said was, oh, yeah, I think I, you know, they had heard about it but it would never get to Dallas. And when John Thomas died recently, 
he was the last man in that room that was still alive. So out of that group of 18 people, I'm the only person still alive. The AIDS crisis has taken every one of them. reach to embrace the hopeless outcast and watch them be There was a, a month when, shortly after I came here in 1987, there was a month when we had 18 funerals. And that was in a church that was only averaging about 280 or 300 in attendance at that time. Forced to confront death, gays and lesbians took their anger to the streets in ways never before seen in Dallas. There will be a lot more figures to go in the City Hall Plaza. In fact, at the rate we're going, we won't have enough room to put all of them here. That business about mosquitoes passing right, age, right. that is pure University of, University of Florida. <laughs> if you're in the boat, you don't rock the boat. It's when you're out of the boat that you rock it. And that's what we did. We literally rocked the boat. You came here to listen. Why don't you listen for a minute? And it took some middle class, white gay boys who were used to having medical care and access at a reasonable amount of time to be backlogged in clinics and pharmacies uh, to say this isn't right. Under my arms, right here, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a swollen nose. John Thomas and others were frustrated because the county hospital had a waiting list for AIDS patients. And the doctor says, well, we have something for you, but unfortunately, because of our formulary practice, you're, you're on a waiting list until someone dies. Well, most people <laughs> would go crazy over that, and so did we. In May, a state district judge ordered Parkland to give AZT to everyone who needs it. Yes, Robert? Yeah, this is Nish from the clinic calling. Yes, we're getting everybody off of the AZT waiting list. Are you ready to start? I mean, the sun was just coming up, and you could hear the hammers, and it was, it was just powerful. And certainly in those days, the activities that were ongoing against our community were criminal. If it screws up, there are no protections, no federal, no state, no city, no county. See, that's our problem. Pure stupidity. Did it study? It was negligent homicide, in my opinion. And so we had to do some things that obviously got lots of attention. I mean, my job was sort of to keep uh, the media focused on what we were going to do, whether it was building crosses and putting them up in a vacant lot or chalking outlines on City Hall Plaza or dumping bodies on the county's doorstep. The time for studies has passed. The time for action is now. It was very unusual, and I don't think anything else could have brought it that brought it forth. I think people had to be dying, and people saw it as a life and death issue, and that's the only way here in Dallas that that kind of activism could be brought forth. We don't have uh, a lot of money to rebuild with, and consequently, this is going to set us back. But. You know, if, if they burned us out thinking that it would get rid of us, they're sadly mistaken. And, and it's very unfortunate that there are people like that in our society. Bigotry was believed to have caused the fire that gutted the Gay Alliance offices. Instead, it was set by a gay man intent on covering up a burglary. Still, out of the ashes came a newfound compassion and perhaps even a sense of renewal. The community center burning was, you know, a real tragedy to us, but, you know, like a phoenix rising out of the ashes, it was a, a godsend. I picked up the phone and called William Wayburn. We went to lunch and I said, the DGLA, the D DGA, needs space, it needs a building. And we have a building we need to sell. 
Soon the church, long the heart of the gay community, was transformed into a community center by the Gay Alliance. It felt like a partnership. It felt like, um, like we were the sort of spiritual social service arm of that organization, at least for a time, and they were the political arm of our organization. And it was really one community, I think, working very hard together. Okay. One of the very first of its kind, the Alliance established a clinic that made available medications and treatments to AIDS patients not yet approved by the FDA, such as pentamidine mist. And there was a food bank. We need your money. It's all for the food pantry. 100% of this money goes to the food pantry. 100% to the food pantry. That's what we, we want your change. We went from being a gay rights movement to being a movement about keeping our friends alive. And that was very hard. Very hard. I had the goal that if I was going to be the conductor of the Turtle Creek Chorale, my goal was to make it the best men's chorus in the world. Little did I know that I was getting into uh, social action as well. Recently divorced from the Baptist Church and his heterosexual married life, Tim Selig bursts out of the closet with fervor, only to find himself face to face with the very closeted gay men's chorus. And often in that first year, I told uh, this group of, you know, dysfunctional gay men, if I'd known I was getting into a dysfunctional group of gay men, I could have stayed in the church and stayed in the other group of dysfunctional gay men. As they emerged from the closet, the corral grew stronger and more visible in the face of death. This chorus has lost many singers, but we haven't lost any of their spirits. And somehow we keep going. There never seemed to be enough tears to express such grief over the loss of so many. By 1992, tens of thousands of people from across the country gathered to remember their loved ones. A mammoth quilt told the story. AIDS would also help alter the perception many gay men had about lesbians and women in general. And then, of course, uh, there's the part about the women jumping in and taking care of the men through the AIDS crisis. And they did that so beautifully and sang and took care of, of guys who were ill. Many of us turned from being co-workers with them and, and, and friends with them to having to be caregivers and bearing so many of them. You know, it was very um, painful. Age 34, died April 4th. If you went to blood bank and said you were a gay man, you couldn't give blood, yet, yet our friends needed blood, and so lesbians formed a group called Blood Sisters, and they would go and give blood. For love, for life, we won't go back. Love. While compassionate, many lesbians were still intent on finding their own voice. One of the big issues that arose back then uh, was the issue of women versus men in the community and what the role of, of both were, whether they could work together. Um, and, and to be frank, the women had to kick some ass to get what they deserved. For some lesbians, though, interacting with gay men was uncomfortable and unacceptable. The Lesbian Resource Center had a, a large number of women who identified as lesbian separatists. They, they didn't get their energy, they didn't feel powerful being around men, and they loved women and wanted to spend their time and energy with women. And the Lesbian Resource Center made a safe place for that. It was not about slamming men, but men had, there were, there were all male bars and all male clubs and all male cruises and all male everything, and it was a place for women to be together. But it was very th threatening, very threatening for a lot of men. Hey, Barnes, this is Mark. How may I help you? Despite some separateness, AIDS demanded the attention of everyone as new social services were created within the gay community.
AIDS Interfaith and eventually AIDS Services of Dallas. AIDS Information, may I help you? At the Oak Lawn Counseling Center in Dallas. The onslaught of AIDS also refocused existing agencies that were originally formed to fight homophobia. I knew there was a need for gay therapists in a, in a gay counseling center. We need more um, education. In the beginning, it was called Oak Lawn Counseling Center. OLCC was the brainchild of Howie Dare, who in the early 80s had enlisted the help of Candy Markham, a therapist who was also a lesbian. He calls me on the phone and his name is Howie. I said, Howie, like baby talk for Howard? <laughs> he said, yes. And I said, well, won't this be fun, Howie and Candy? Howie realized that there were a lot of gay men and women who who had difficulty with their own orientation and the classical sense were homophobic because they had never dealt with their identity. And a lot of them had trouble finding psychologists, therapists, social workers who would help them in the process without increasing their guilt or shame. It really changed over the years as AIDS and HIV uh, took the, the forefront. And be, we really shifted into that crisis mode. Um, it was painful. People were dying left and right. Uh, it was depressing. And we were fighting for our lives then. When I first tested positive, it was back in 1987. And by February of 96, lost my sight. Maybe that's one reason why I stayed involved with AIDS and HIV work for so long. Um, my way of getting back at the virus, if I couldn't fight it, can conquer it in my body, I could conquer it in the community. The AIDS crisis would become the beneficiary of inventive fundraising efforts modeled in other parts of the country. Glittery jackets designed by the famous and auctioned off at sparkling prices were the AIDS offering in an annual event sponsored by DIFA, Design Industries Foundation Fighting AIDS. and the Dallas Black Tie Dinner. Driven by one of the most aggressive chapters of the human rights campaign, has evolved into an annual fundraising soiree of absolute fabulousness. Ann Richards, please accept our love and our affection. Proceeds from the Black Tie benefit AIDS service providers as well as the Turtle Creek Corral and the Women's Chorus of Dallas, both influenced by John Thomas. He was a shining example for everyone else. And, and I think while there are other people who have meant a lot to the development of gay and lesbian Dallas, I don't think anyone stands on the same level as him. I met John within months of my arrival here. And he said, you're really green, we need to go to lunch. And I was like, well, I'm not all that green, but okay, lunch is good. So we went to lunch and we would go to lunch periodically and then he said, we need to go to lunch every week. And we went every Wednesday for nine years. John Thomas will always be a David who taught us to throw stones and slay the giant of injustice. And so, to break the other part of the ground of this bell wall, will you welcome Mr. John Thomas. As one of his final gestures, John Thomas agreed to help lead the capital campaign for a new and larger cathedral. So we went and asked John Thomas first. He was the top man on the list and was clearly the person that we wanted to do this. And so. Uh, so we went to him and he said, well, you know, so you, you're gonna need a woman. If I did this, who would you hope would be the woman? And we said, well, we would hope it would be Lori Masters. And he said, well, if Lori will do it, then I will. Reverend Piazza commissioned world-renowned architect Philip Johnson to design the new $20 million cathedral, an unprecedented creation. Jesus took the cup. Piazza understands the world, understands human emotions, and he knows why he's building this cathedral. 
he made a plea for this kind of tolerance in America that is, was moving to the core. Now, that's the kind of man I can work for. Cathedral of Hope is uh, the largest gay and lesbian church in the world. Uh, there is a lot of power in that church. People may not like to hear that, but, but it's got a lot of support in the community. People listen to what they say. They are noticed nationally. I think that every, every viable candidate for an office like this needs to come with some background of activism. In the last half of the 80s, Bill Nelson's two unsuccessful bids for a Dallas City Council seat as an openly gay candidate inspired a new outness in local politics. What he had to say had so little to do with any kind of a narrow gay agenda and so much to do with a vision of what the city of Dallas could have. I was absolutely blown away. I was really amazed myself because I had somehow thought, oh, well, you know, he's coming as a gay candidate, but he wasn't. Bill mainstreamed us. Bill became, Bill's the one who got us involved in the neighborhood associations. Bill was a social strategist. He, he understood you know, those issues of discrimination. He knew that we really had to broaden our horizons. I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Even as Weyburn, Nelson, and others struggled for a place at the mainstream table, they heard from lesbians who also understood issues of discrimination. The women petitioned the Gay Alliance for yet another name change. There were a lot of people who just opposed just suddenly throwing the name lesbian into it. If you're fighting an enemy within your community, you're probably not fighting an enemy, an enemy outside of your community. There's only so much time. History will recall Reagan did the least of all. And that time belonged to AIDS. Dallas Gay Lesbian Alliance can help you. Finally, though, the Gay Alliance changed its name. Mr. Cox? Hi, I'm Craig McDaniel, Mr. Cox. And I'm finally, an openly gay candidate was elected to the city council. And Craig McDaniel and his partner, Ron Ruggles. I wasn't a gay person running for office. I was a neighborhood leader and, and somebody interested in, with the right experience running for office who was gay. Today, Dallas has sworn in the most diverse city council it has ever elected. And I am proud to represent and be a part of that diversity. While Craig McDaniel was the only openly gay politician in Dallas, he was by no means the only gay person who had ever been elected to city council. When I ran the first time, um, I went to go visit a few people in the gay and lesbian community who I knew, um, and one of them was John Thomas. And I said, John, I'm, I'm going to run, um, and I just want you to know that, that I'm not going to run as an openly gay candidate. And Chris Luna never discussed his sexual orientation, but he never tried to pass as a heterosexual either. I think the people that were elected played the game, and that was the Dallas way to do it. That does not mean that we don't still examine those departments' budgets carefully. Craig Holcomb came from a family that was part of Dallas' establishment. I was married. I had a business. In the course of serving on the council, I got a divorce, and the business went into bankruptcy. But hey, no deal's perfect. <laughs> and I came out. And that's as kind as I can be. Even uh, though Craig McDaniel are, already had run successfully as an openly gay race. candidate, Senator Jose Plata chose not to take that route when he made a bid ballot. for the Dallas uh, School Board. Plata nearly won the January election with 49% of the vote. But since then, Dallas's Hispanic media reported he's gay, something he declines to address. It was never an issue for this campaign, and it never will be. And I wasn't running because I was a gay man. I was running because I was more concerned about what was happening to the lack of learning and the lack of standards and the lack of motivation to get our kids through schools. It's, it's just always been that education has been in my life. And I'm the 10th of 11 children, uh, and uh, we always understood that education was important to us to, to get to move on and be successful. Tribble and Griffin will not allow us to forget about this, Jack. Sorry, we'll see you in court. <laughs> Any strides made in the early 90s by elected gay leaders came about despite many showings of downright hate. 
Dallas Judge Jack Hampton told a newspaper reporter he went easy on a man who killed two gays because he didn't much care for queers. I did not mean to condemn the homosexual community generally, and I used the poor choice of words. I'm sorry about that. I certainly was not out publicly at all, was not involved in the community in any major way. And there were two protests that day, and I, I think, and I went to a candlelight vigil, and I went by myself, and so that was really, like, you know, sort of scary. And I sort of hid behind my camera. That was a major catalyst that got me involved in the community, that made me realize that whatever needs to be done, whatever we're going to be able to do to stand up for ourselves, we have to do it ourselves. The gays have been given a feather pillar ever since they come out of the closet. We eventually, we have no rights. We will never forget. The public outcry provoked by the judge's inflammatory statements also brought up contradictions within the gay community itself, including out and out racism. You know, you would think of all communities that the gay community will be more accepting and more understanding to this issue. But what I found is totally opposite. I went to a bar and was asked for three IDs. I had my birth certificate and my driver's license. That was not sufficient. I felt that I, uh, to, to be seen and to be heard, I had to get involved. Inside the gay lifestyle or outside in the real world, discrimination was never far away and all too often determined who got hired, thanks to that old nemesis of the gay community, 2106. I, I got down here Monday morning and then I was flat out told because I am gay and willing to admit it, I dis, I'm disqualified from finishing my tests for the Dallas PD. Our uh, policies uh, and, and questions and standards that we have set within the Dallas Police Department parallel those uh, state statutes that, that touch on the topic of, of deviant sexual behavior. Council members called for a public debate on the matter. The secretary will uh, now convene the public hearing for item 77 which is a public hearing on police hiring policy regarding the prohibition of the employment of, ho of homosexuals by the police department. And it was ugly. And there were people at City Hall that were wearing buttons, um, people from the extreme radical right. And it had the buttons, round buttons, that said homo with a big red line drawn through them. My name is Clyde Riddle Jr. and I'm definitely opposed to it. Sister Mary McLemore, I'm against the change. Against the change. I'm strongly for the change. <laughs> The city paid Mike England 40 some odd thousand dollars in an out of court settlement uh, to make the issue go away. After the Dallas Police Department was successfully sued for discriminating against the lesbian job applicant, the city council, led by Craig McDaniel, approved an ordinance prohibiting discrimination against city employees based on their sexual orientation. Why wouldn't you encourage policies that would uh, help you get that edge? Uh, Corporate America has, has certainly done that, uh, and we ought to be able to do the same. And it was the most amazing thing, because people came together from all across the city to support this. Mainstream clergy people, businesses, American Airlines sent a letter of support. Um, Craig got Coretta Scott King to send a letter of support. The final person to speak on behalf of passing this was uh, an African-American woman who'd been involved in city politics for a long time named Bernice Washington. If there is a job to be done, the only question is, who is best prepared to do it? And then the crowd moved into spontaneous eruption of applause and yelling. <laughs> While the city council's support of the non-discrimination ordinance offended some, it also called into question once again the arbitrary nature of the anti-sodomy law. That's still on the books. John Thomas and Charlotte Taft were among a group of five who once again challenged 2106 and lost. And it just, you know, judges are elected in Texas, and it felt like one more thing that it was just still too hot 
for people to handle, which is, you know, I, I'm, it's almost unbelievable to me to think that 2106 is still on the books. And after all the Dallas stuff and all the police department stuff and, you know, how it, it's almost like the legislature is going to be the last to know that it's over. Twenty one oh six and religious fervor are often used to fuel anti gay forces. Less than a year after the murder of Nicholas West, a gay man in Tyler, the Gay Alliance sponsored a bus tour through East Texas to show support for gays and lesbians living in small towns. We pull up to Gilmer, Texas, the courthouse. And there was a crowd of people just screaming, yelling, holding protest signs, and saying, fags burn in hell, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, you know, all this stuff. And they, they were there waiting for us. And we got off the bus not really knowing what was going to happen. We never had a queer rally before, and we're not queers. We don't want them in our town. God will burn this town down if it gets full of gays. Damning words whether shouted from the streets or spoken behind closed doors, spark repercussions. It's painful to have someone tape and distribute any private conversation. School board member Dan Peavy got caught on tape referring to fellow board members with the N-word and the Q-word. On the tape, I believe I was referred to as that queer in Oak Cliff. And, and jokingly, I, I tell people, it, it, he got the word wrong. It's not queer, it's queen. I have never witnessed dealing with as many ignorant MF, and it's spelled out, MF. It is just bigotry at its highest level. The tapes that we received from Dan Peavy certainly tested the board's ability to understand their role in addressing hatred and bigotry and putting it into policy to, to stop it. Dan Peavy resigned and the school board approved an anti-harassment policy for both teachers and students. But policy doesn't always translate. I would receive notes in my locker daily saying I was going to, they were going to kill me. When I got to public school, high school, um, I had to like toughen up because nobody was there for, for me. It's 30. 30, okay. And then if, once you know that, then you know what this diagonal is equal to also, right? Mm -hmm. To provide a safe place for gay and lesbian teens, a small charter school opened its doors in 1997. At the time, Walt Whitman distinguished itself as the only private high school of its kind in America. The bigger picture of why did I start in Dallas is because I feel like there's more kids like these kids who need us to step up and say, wait a minute, there's a problem going on here. There's less of a possibility of tolerance, you know, because we are in the Bible Belt. I feel that since I, I came here and my, my self, I picked myself back up off the floor. My self-esteem isn't on the floor anymore and I feel much better about myself. I think the kids are pretty strong but they're also really vulnerable and the times are just different and some of them are really out and some of them aren't out at all. Maybe they've been kicked out of their family because they have come out and there's, I think there's still a huge need to address the youth. We're loud, we're proud, deep in the heart of Texas. Now into the new millennium, the gay community continues to struggle for acceptance, fairness, and legal protection in a sometimes cruel world. For two days, a series of revelations in Jasper have revealed just how deep hate can run. One of the men arrested for Bird's death says they killed him because he was black. When James Bird was brutally dragged to death, his murder kindled new efforts for stricter hate crimes legislation. But in 1999, Texas lawmakers rejected the bill solely because it included gays and lesbians. 2106 comes up every time. It's still a threat, even though in the courts it's been ruled unconstitutional. It's still held up and was during the hate crimes. During the hate crimes, one of the arguments against passing the hate crimes was by our, our uh, Bubba's uh, was that we would be fostering something that's on the books as illegal. So it needs to get off. It needs to get off.
I think that's what almost everybody wants to do is to make the world better for those who, who come after them and, and certainly I, I hope that, that I have done that. I had a lot of gay people who thought I was uh, irresponsible radical. <laughs> so many people who grew up in the gay rights movement were, were mentored by Bill Nelson and Terry Thibodeau and John Thomas and people of that, that like. I'm a glass half full person and an optimistic realist. And so I felt we had done a good job. The time for action is now. Something went right. Different people came together at certain times and places and were able to produce results. We've all arrived at this spot in our lives by different avenues, but we're here now. So why not focus that energy and that talent and be inclusive of all and go forward? Am I a trailblazer? I don't know. I'm only doing what I think is right. But we can have a big responsibility in that powerful sense, not like the duty kind of responsibility, but the kind of responsibility that is what gets you up in the morning. The thing that makes, that makes it all worthwhile so that at the end of your life you look back and say, I lived a full life and I, and I made contributions that really mattered. You've got to have passion for what you believe in. And you've got to find someone else that has that passion when you leave the organization. You know, I think the community owes me a gold watch. I've got 30 years in this. <laughs> and I am ready to retire. Finding Our Voice, the Dallas gay and lesbian community is made possible in part by Uptown Realtors, with 80 associates and staff that serve and reflect the diversity of Dallas. By Crest Auto Group, supporting black tie in the community for 13 years. Crest family of fine cars, Infinity, Cadillac, Oldsmobile, Isuzu. By Via Star Services Corporation, which salutes the heroes of the Dallas gay and lesbian community by members like you with additional financial support provided by the following individuals and foundations.